All right, so our problem states, the roof framing plan of a two-story building is shown below. Size the roof joists and provide the required spacing. Provide blocking if necessary to keep the design economical. And then it gives us the design data to use sawn lumber, Douglas for large number two as the material for the joist, and then the net service uplift load. So by that we understand it's a wind load. It is 65 PSF ASD. And then three, these three adjustment factors are equal to one. Now, if you recall our previous problem, this one is very, very similar. It's pretty much the same building, but now we're designing the roof joists instead of the floor joists. I have here the previous problem that we, that we solved in the previous video. It was very straightforward. We checked the flexion, bending, and shear. And if you know, notice here, dead plus live is uh, 65 PSF which is the same that I have here as the net service uplift. I did this on purpose for us to see the difference between when you have oh, dead plus live load, so the load duration coefficient C sub D is different, is in our case, it was 1.0 here, but then when we have wind load, this will be a different factor, it will, it will increase and we'll see it uh, later on. The other difference is that before, which is typical for floor joists, the compression flange was fully braced because the flooring, whether it's plywood or metal deck, it, was, it braces the compression flange or the top portion of the joist. Now, for an uplift load on a roof joist, that's not the case, right? Because the bottom of the joist is unbraced unless we provide some sort of bridging or blocking to brace that bottom flange. So that's why the problem asks to also provide blocking if necessary. In other words, let's check it first as is with this load, see if it works. If it doesn't, we'll see what controls and if by adding blocking, it will help us optimize our design. All right, so the first check that we did last time was the flexion. I listed it here. Um, for us to, to note as well, but we know that the flexion is not going to control in this case because, or we know it works by comparison because the loading is the same as last time and the span is the same. So if we try a two by 12 joist at 12 inches on center, which is the same as the previous problem, our maximum allowable um, deflection is 0.53 inches. And this is assuming the most stringent case from IBC, which is for roof members uh, supporting plaster or stucco ceiling. In other words, you don't want your ceiling, if it's a stucco ceiling to crack because your members are deflecting too much under wind load. So if we use this spacing here and this joist and we get it to work, we don't have to worry about deflection because we already calculated it before. Now, Let's get to our bending, our bending stress check. The first thing we need to note here is that all the factors are very similar to last time, except C sub D, which is equal to 1.6 for wind load. And C sub L, we're going to calculate now because it's not going to be equal to one. And I'll grab MD NDS here, the specification. And if you follow the previous videos from this playlist, I believe it was the very first one, I went through all these tabs. So if you haven't checked it out, make sure you check it out after this video. But I can grab here my handy tab on chapter two, which is the load duration table. And if you're taking the PE or any other computer-based exam and you can't use tabs, just try to be familiar with the actual specification. So know that this is in chapter two. That's always where you're going to find your load factors. And we see here for wind and earthquake loads, C sub D is equal to 1.6. So now that we got that out of the way, we have just to calculate C sub L. And that's where it gets a little bit tricky. I have here the, the answers on this side, but let's first focus on step 2.1 here. So C sub L, 
we're gonna have a bunch of formulas instead of showing them all to you right here let me bring you back to the specification so that we always get familiar with where to find things on the specification so i have another handy dandy tab here for design and this is in chapter three where we can calculate c sub l so i open it up and right there i have a big formula for c sub l but before that let's take a quick look here at this section 3.3.3 .3. so the beam st stability factor is c sub l if you have your member that the depth is less than the width in other words in other words you have your member like flatwise then c sub l is equal to one or lateral torsional buckling wouldn't control that case if the member is the compression flange is fully supported or fully braced which was the case from our previous problem then c sub l is also equal one now if it's not um, fully braced then we have to calculate c sub l which is not going to be equal to to one for that we need to find two two lengths the first length that we need to find is the unbraced length LU which is from this table here or it shows in this table but LU is the distance between bracing points so in this first case we're going to run it as LU being equal to the span length so LU is going to be equal to 16 feet and then the effective length is going to be based on this table here in our case, we're going to calculate LU, the um, span length over D, or, and, or the unbraced length is LU. See if it's less than, point, less than 7 for a single span with uniformly distributed load, then we, you'd, we would use this formula. If it, that ratio is greater than 7, greater than or equal to 7, we use this formula. And once we do that, sorry, let me get back to here we can then calculate r sub b which is the slenderness ratio and this has an upper limit of 50 and this is a code limit basically saying that we cannot design we cannot use members that are too slender something that's really deep and very thin if that ratio the slenderness ratio exceeds 50 we're in trouble we have to use a different member size and then after we calculate r sub b we calculate this F sub B E, which this is also, I believe, elastic buckling stress. Um, the name of this variable, I, I can't remember 100% now, so you can double check that. But essentially, we're going to calculate this and then calculate the ratio of F sub B E over F sub B asterisk. And this is F sub B prime with all the factors except C sub L. And then we plug it all in here and then we finally get our C sub L and get our capacity. I know this was a lot and it is a lot to be honest. So let's see how it plays out with numbers. And we're gonna do it a couple times. This way it really cements this uh, procedure for us. So we're going to see it here, all that big formula, and then when we, need, we know we need to calculate F sub B E, and we need to calculate R sub B, and we need to calculate E mean, E, e minimum prime. So there are a lot of things to calculate, and that's the thing with NDS and with design. Lots of factors and a lot of um, empirical equations. First thing here, L U over D is 17 so it's greater than 7 therefore we used um, that second equation I showed in the table is 1.63 LU plus 3 times D once we plug that in we see that our effective length is actually 28.9 feet even and this is very important so make sure you don't mess this up because it can drastically change the results and I, even when I was doing this, I initially had messed up and had to correct this because it's so easy to um, skip over this length and just use the span length. 
but the span length here is 16 feet as opposed to LE being the effective length being almost 30 feet so it's almost double um, so just be careful with that we calculate this slenderness ratio here plugging L sub E into this equation and then we get 42 and you see that we're actually pretty close to the code prescribed limit so this, uh, this already gives us a hint that we're going to get a pretty low um, C sub L as we're going to see later it's going to be 0.235 because the, our member is very very slender um, then we calculate this ratio here 0 0.239 and then after you get this ratio you can just plug this ratio into this equation and then you get your C sub L okay so basically we are reducing our load our capacity by quite a bit as I do it here uh, I calculated F sub B asterisk um, which is using all these factors and the only factor I did not mention was uh, C sub R, which is the repetitive use factor. And that's because our members are spaced at 12 inches on center. If it's 24 inches on center or less, this factor is uh, 1.15, as I mentioned in my previous video. Um, so once we apply C sub L, our capacity is only 319 PSI. So this is very, very little as compared to our demand which is 788.9 psi so it's not acceptable and you may be wondering where i got this demand from well i got this from our previous problem since i kept this the same as the previous problem i didn't rewrite all of that but our demand is just the required moment divided by the section modulus and once we had decreased the spacing here to 12 inches our demand was 788.9 PSI. So that's why I'm using that demand. Now, this did not work, right? Not even close. So let's add blocking. In other words, let's reduce our effective length. We are going to add blocking first at mid span, and then we're going to recalculate C sub L. The formulas are all the same, so I'm not going to go over all of them again. The only thing that I'll go over is what's different here. This LU over D, my unbraced length, is 8 times 12, 96 inches, because it's half of the span, which is 16 feet. And then it's greater than 7, so we use that same formula, and we get the effective length now as 15.9 feet. So it's a lot less. It's almost half of what we got before. And then our C sub L almost doubles, right? Uh, it is 0 0.422. And this didn't get us there yet, which is unfortunate because then we're going to have to redo this or do another iteration to see if this is going to work. We're pretty close, 6099 PSI for F um, sub B prime, but we're still under 788.9. So let's do it again. Now we're going to add blocking at third points and then recalculate C sub L. And as we can see here, our slenderness ratio decreased even further. Now our LU over D, since LU is 16 feet divided by 3, which yields, which is equal to 64 inches, we are actually less than 7 with this L, LU over D ratio. So we used here the other formula for the effective length and that gives us an effective length of about 11 feet. So it's a lot less. And then we plug and chug everything back into the same equation and then we get now C sub L equal to 0 0.582. And then when we calculate our capacity, boom, we are greater than our demand so we are okay therefore we can use 2 by 12 Douglas for large number 2 joists at 12 inches on center with full depth blocking at third points I really hope um, you guys enjoyed this let me know if there are more um, with design problems you want me to solve I plan to keep going on this list now that I'm finally done with the SE exam 
and I hope to just build on it and form a really nice database of wood problems for us to learn together. And I'll see you next time.